All right, guys, Murph's here. And today I want to talk about my fighting rifle setup basics or kind of my standard for how it is that I set up fighting rifles. Now, let's go ahead and kind of define what a fighting rifle is. So a fighting rifle to me is a weapon system that I tend to use for self-defense both in and out of the home. Kind of like the same thing as a truck gun, but I'm not just thinking about it as being used in my vehicle. So for some people, this might be like their end of the world gun or their zombie apocalypse gun, whatever it may be, whatever whatever situation you expect yourself, kind of worst case scenario to be fighting in, that's what this rifle is for. Now, regardless of the platform, regardless of what it is that you're running, AK, AR, Mini 14, Red Rider PB gun, I don't care. It's important to kind of have a methodology set up for how it is that you want the rifle kind of streamlined or streamlined or optimized. And one of the key things here is every fighting rifle needs three components, in my opinion. Like 100%, you have to have these things in order to be able to have a successful fighting rifle. And then you kind of get into your pure preference aspect of it, all right? Now, I've talked about this kind of stuff a little bit in my home defense rifle setup video, and a lot of that stuff still holds true for what it is that we're talking about today. Just in this case, I'm a lot more rigid on this this particular aspect of the concept because we're not talking about just fighting within my own home to where I can set things down or I can kind of prepare the battlefield however it is that I want it to be. In a fighting rifle type concept, I have to be open to the idea that I'm going to be moving into potentially suboptimal situations for myself or might have to kind of adapt to a scenario as it unfolds instead of necessarily being able to set up everything in the way that I want it. So how it is that I put the rifle together is going to help dictate that. Now, let's go ahead and kind of get into the process. And I have a couple of examples of fighting rifles that I have put together over the years to kind of more or less demonstrate it. Now, barrel length and all that kind of stuff, that's gonna come down to your purpose. You know, barrel length, caliber, weapons platform, that's all gonna come down to whatever works with you most naturally. So we're not necessarily gonna get into that. Other than to say, you know, smaller, lighter, more compact is going to be easier to be able to move around tight spaces. It's going to be easier to be able to carry all day and all that kind of stuff. And if you go with an intermediate cartridge or something along those lines, you'll be able to carry more ammunition, more of a lighter weight cartridge that's still going to perform effectively at the distances that you're probably going to be fighting at. Now, that is also a big portion that we have to discuss about this is that we have to figure out at what distance we expect our fight to come from. And that's a lot of that is going to come down to where it is that you live. If you live in an inner city, you're going to have different requirements than somebody who, say, lives on the frontier in Alaska or something along those lines. So you kind of got to consider how it is that you're actually going to be fighting. Now, there's a couple things that also come to the fighting. It's the type of fighting. So long range shooting in a defensive type scenario is really hard to justify why you had to kill that person. So if you're, if we're still in a position where like, you know, law enforcement and the government are still a thing and, and whatever it is that your scenario in your head for why you need a fighting rifle, you know, if it comes to, to fruition, then you're going to have to explain to a judge why that guy at 300 yards with a baseball bat was a threat to you with a firearm. So you can kind of you can kind of see how that dynamic goes overall. I think for the vast majority of people, when we're talking about a fighting rifle, we need to be able to account for close range conflict. That's one of the major drives that we have to keep in mind. So this is this is a concept I've been developing for a really long time. You can kind of see it in this Mini 14. Like this Mini 14 is indicative of the three things, and there's a little bit of a caveat on one of the things that I find to be really important in my fighting rifles, and this rifle kind of helped me feel along that path. All right, now, I'm gonna put these things into a kind of order, but you don't necessarily have to follow this order. First off, let's talk about optics. Sights in general are a really critical aspect of a fighting rifle. You have to be able to put the shots where you need them to go. Now, some rifles come with iron sights already on them, some do not. AR-15s, it's become more and more prevalent to see them not already outfitted with sights. In my personal opinion, you need something better than iron sights. 
I do have designated setups that only run iron sights and I primarily use that as a training tool for myself so that I make sure I'm still working on my fundamentals and all that kind of stuff and I'm being a well-rounded shooter. On anything that I'm seriously considering as a fighting rifle, I have some type of optic. Now what type of optic you pick is kind of up to you. However, there's a couple things that I think you should take into consideration when it is that you're selecting optics. So, can I see them at night? That's a really big portion. It's not just a matter of whether or not you have a flashlight on you or something like that. Are you able to engage without giving your position away? So this is where illuminated reticles or red dots and stuff like that have a lot of advantage over other options. There are tritium infused rifle iron sights and those would definitely be handy for engaging in the dark. Just, you know, you, you got the iron sights issue where, you know, multiple focal planes and all that kind of stuff. So I prefer to have some type of optic and whenever I'm considering optics for use on a defensive rifle, one of the things that I think about is shooting from unnatural positions. Am I going to be able to work around a barrier and be able to shoot from suboptimal but still behind cover positions in order to be able to engage a target? That's, a, that's, that's something that I think about a lot. That's actually why I wind up using a lot of red dots on my rifles because once you get them zeroed, they're exceedingly easy to work with if you can't necessarily get that same cheek weld every time. You know? All right, cool. Well, I'm in a position where I've kind of I got to get all scrunched up on the rifle and just kind of lay my face across it, and it's it's not necessarily optimal for shooting or for you know recoil management and all that kind of stuff. But I can still get behind my optic enough to be able to make impacts at whatever distance it is that I'm trying to shoot. That's that's a real advantage of red dots. Now, that's not to say that you can't do the same type of thing with magnified optics like this True Glow one to six on this on my go-to rifle previously reviewed on the channel however that's something that you got to keep in mind whenever it is that you're selecting your optic as to how well it's going to work out in whatever condition that you're trying to use it in so this Omnia 6 actually surprisingly has a very forgiving eye box which allows me to position my face however it is that I need to in order to be able to make the hits at whatever distance I'm trying to. I've worked this thing around barriers and it actually performs surprisingly well. Uh, I, I really appreciate about this fairly budget-minded optic in all honesty. Now that is something that does drive me away from things like magnifiers because one of the things that I don't like about magnifiers is that in order to be able to work around a barrier I'm going to move that magnifier out of the way and now it's an additional piece of the rifle that I have to kind of account for and manage and it, a lot of times like the last time I worked barriers with a, a magnifier it kept poking me in the face and that was really irritating and not maybe not necessarily something that would keep you from being able to win a firefight or something along those lines but it's it's not comfortable like it, it's kind of it's kind of distracting in all honesty you sit there you know you're all scrunched up rolled over and all that kind of stuff and you, you squeeze off a shot and the poke yourself in the forehead it's just silly. Like that's that's kind of an issue. And some people say, "Oh, we'll just remove it." Okay, and put it where? You know, do I do I throw it in the dump pouch or something like that? And then I I, I run to my next position, and potentially drop it on the ground or lose it, or something along those lines. And if you're military law enforcement and you lose that bad boy, that's a statement of charges. I mean, I guess theoretically, if you're not military law enforcement and you lose it, it's also a statement of charges because you're still going to have to replace it. You just assign yourself the statement of charges. But it's, it's kind of a silly overall option, and I don't like having to remove parts of things to be able to make them work in a scenario. So that's why I generally stay away from magnifiers with optics. I am trying it out again. My rifle at work right now does have an EOTech and a magnifier on it. And I'm just I'm gonna get it I'm gonna give it another solid try and see if I can make it work better for me this time around. But I don't have high expectations. All right, I don't want to spend too much time talking about optics other than to identify that make sure your optic is matching your situation. If you're running fairly close type situations, a red dot is an excellent choice. It's gonna work out really great, and you can potentially push it out to greater overall distance. Most people like to say that red dots are only good out to like. 100 yards and that's bogus. I, I regularly take mine to 400 yards which is the furthest range I have to shoot here. I have taken them out to 500 before. However, it's not easy. 
And if you're consistently thinking that you're gonna be fighting at a little bit greater overall distance, then perhaps something like either a fixed power optic like this BSA four power mounted on my old Mini 14, or one to four, or one to six, you know, whatever it is that you're after might be more conducive to what it is that you're trying to do. What I would discourage you from on a fighting rifle is using a more powerful variable power optic, like a like a three to nine or a four to sixteen, or or really even a two to seven. I think might be a tad too powerful, but maybe it's kind of flirting that line right there. Specifically because that's entirely too much magnification, which is going to put a lot of restrictions on your eye box and is going to make it more difficult to use in a lot of the closer situations. Because ultimately, one of the important things to keep in mind about your fighting rifle is that you should be able to flex from your intended long range distance to close range if required. So like ACOGs, theoretically you can use ACOGs in closer quarters combat. It's not ideal, but shooting with both eyes open and all that kind of stuff, you can go ahead and superimpose that chevron or whatever reticle it is that you're using on your target and be able to drive it that way. So something to consider there. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to tell you what decisions you should make as much as some things to consider. Kind of like reticle choice, you know? That's a very subjective thing. I like a more bare bones reticle because I just need enough data to be able to work off of so that I can hit a man sized target. I'm not necessarily trying to hit dude through the left eye as much as I just want to hit him in the head because he's going to be a lot less useful in the fight if I put holes that weren't already there in his head. So something to consider. Now with optic also comes like a little caveat that goes along with it which is backup sights. And I am very forgiving on backup sites. You just need some sort of backup option. So lasers, offset optics, offset irons, or flip up iron sights, hell, even all the time up iron sights are completely acceptable for backup sites. Just pick a sighting system that you can use and understand its limitations as well. So this rifle is set up with a uh, fire field green laser light combo. And it's not much of a light, I can tell you that right now. But this is my backup setup because I cannot fit iron sights on this gun. This really only works at close range. So I already actively have that working against me should I ever need to use this weapon system in a longer range self-defense situation. And for some reason, my optic has gone down. Now, one of the great things about the laser is that it's fairly easy to work around and is not incumbent on your optic not being in some way dirty. So an issue that you'll sometimes hear with your flip up iron sights, if you're using them with like a, a red dot or something along those lines, is that if, let's say this thing just takes a dive into some mud and it's all covered up and I, I don't have the time to clean it off, well, I still can't necessarily view my iron sights through this thing that is still choked up with mud. The thing that is keeping me from being able to use the optic is also the thing that is gonna keep me from being able to use my iron sights. Okay, so that's, that's a definite disadvantage and there's something to be said for having quick detach mounts so that you can just go ahead and remove the optic entirely so that you can get to your iron sights. Maybe something that you need to take into account overall. I do not have anything that is necessarily set up that way. I don't expect that to be an issue, but it is a refinement that I might look forward to or I might look to do in the future. Now, this rifle is set up with backup irons and I do not have a quick detach optic mount for this right now. So what I should be looking to do, and I'll get around to it eventually, I got a lot of projects going on at any one time. What I should be looking to do is either get a QD mount on this setup or take off these iron sights and start running some type of offset setup, which I'm actually employing on another rifle that I really can't wait to show you guys once it's finally working properly little teaser. Now, I've been spending a lot of time looking at offset sight setups between optics and irons. And I have most recently decided that I like the idea of offset optics more so than I do irons. And this is entirely based around the fact of yet again, I'm working in a suboptimal situation. So instead of 
going to a rollover type setup and then having to align two different focal points in a suboptimal position, which I'm then probably gonna have to use around barriers or something along that line. I might potentially have to use around barriers and while I try to run around and utilize cover. Instead of trying to line up two focal planes in just an ever diminishing suboptimal setup, a red dot is a little bit faster and easier to pick up. And then also when doing cross shoulder stuff and all that kind of thing, it's gonna be easier to be, uh, be able to stay on top of that red dot than it might be on iron sights. Just something to consider overall. I know some people who are against that idea because they don't like the idea of their backup being battery powered. And I can understand that. I can totally 100% appreciate that aspect of it. I would throw out, however, that with current red dots, battery life, battery life is insane. You can find all kinds of red dots with just absolutely insane battery life and it shouldn't really be an issue. Overall, I am more worried about not necessarily batteries dying on me as much as optics being damaged beyond use. That's my greater concern and that's what I'm thinking about with that. Now, iron sights don't run on batteries. So based off of that overall argument, the iron sight is probably still at least the more longevity minded option but I think the red dot is easier overall to employ for the same reasons that it's easier to fight with the red dot on a rifle than it is with iron sights. It's not impossible, it's just easier. Just something to consider there. That's kind of my outlook on that. All right, so we've gotten optic and backup optic, or backup iron sights, backup sights, that's what we'll call it, backup sights out of the way. What's the next thing? Slings. Rifles need slings. That, that needs to be a constant. Especially a fighting rifle. If you're gonna be in a situation that's outside of your own home and you might have to do something other than just fight with the rifle, like, I don't know, provide self-aid or maneuver around obstacles, climb over things, or potentially have to drag a buddy or something along those lines. If you are in any situation that you need both of your hands available, you're gonna want a sling going to be a pretty important thing. In addition to that, slings also help you stabilize the shots if you have to do some offhand shooting and you don't necessarily have a barrier to be able to press into and all that kind of stuff. So slings are definitely a really important addition to a rifle and should be very high on your acquire list. Like this should be among the top things that you get right off the bat. I understand optic because you need to get it zero and all that kind of stuff and guns don't necessarily come with iron sights, but sling is right up there as being fairly important. And slings are generally fairly cheap. You don't have to spend a lot of money to get a good sling. This is an exceedingly cheap bungee sling setup. It's not my favorite. I do plan on eventually replacing this, but I do like having it around as something that I can get on rifles as soon as I get them so that they're now viable and I can get them into the fight. I have run... I have been running some one-point slings on some rifles, and I've got to say, guys, I'm not a fan. And this is definitely going to be something that gets replaced on this rifle as soon as I have the time and energy to spare it the attention. There's, there's some real advantages to two-point slings that one-points just don't cover. If you don't have to do any type of movement, you're just hanging out on a range, a one point ain't too bad. If you have to actually start incorporating movement and doing things with your hands that are not controlling the rifle, one points are pretty terrible. Now, my favorite type of sling overall, whoops, are two point adjustable slings. As you can see here, this has a little adjustable strap right here, which allows me to cinch it to my body or loosen it up as I need. And that's pretty fantastic because I can go from having it cinched up nice and close to me so that I can work around whatever it is I need to work around, you know, cross an obstacle or, or you know, render aid or whatever it may be. And then as soon as we're getting into a situation where I'm maybe a little bit more concerned that I need to be more fluid in my fighting capability, I can loosen that up drape this thing around my neck, and then I can cross shoulders, I can work around barriers, I can do all the things that I need to do in order to be able to pie corners or cross objectives, whatever it is. It's a real advantage that two-point slings have over a lot of different types of slings out on the market. Now, three-point slings, honestly not a fan. 
It has been years since I've run a three-point sling, and I have been thinking about getting one for a rifle just so I can kind of refresh myself on how much I dislike three-point slings. But I think they, they're they very good for a very narrow application, and if we're talking about kind of a do-all fighting rifle type setup, which is what I'm most commonly thinking of with fighting rifles, something that I, I can kind of press into a lot of different scenarios, a three-point may not necessarily be what you want to do. Um, just something to consider overall, I guess. All right, so we covered slings. Now let's talk about lights. Huge fan of lights. They These are a very important thing because we do need to be able to identify threats in the night. So there's a couple of things that go along with that because every time you use your light to identify a threat in the night, you're also exposing yourself. So very measured use of your light is very important. But lights are still an important function of it. And then also being able to have a reticle that you can see in the dark after you identify that target and you go back to, to blackout is just why this combination, this one-two punch is so important. Now, whether or not there's lasers combined with your light is entirely pure preference at that point. I run a variety of different lights. This is a uh, Surefire M600, which I've been running with the clicky caps. I'm a big fan of clicky caps, specifically because there's a diminished possibility of a light negligent discharge. That's something that I'm, I'm pretty concerned about overall. I don't want to accidentally identify where it is that I am. I want to make sure that whenever I do it, I do it on purpose, that I need a, a distinct motion to do the thing. I think that's very important. That is also why I have this, which is a Enforce WMXL, which is 700 lumens, and it also has a IR capability. So as you can see there, I run it on top of the rail, and I can get to it and you know I control when the light comes on and off there's no possibility that I'm accidentally going to grab that or there's a diminished possibility I'm going to accidentally grab that whereas if I run pressure pads dropping the rifle into a slung position could you know bounce off my leg or something like that and cause the light to come on uh, mo moving around the rifle switching back and forth across shoulders could potentially cause me to discharge the light by accident, all those types of things is why I'm really not a big fan of pressure pads. And I've been moving away from the use of pressure pads. The lumens output, that's that's a pure preference at that point, but one of the things that I would really point out as being very important about however it is that you have your light set up is that you be able to reach it from either side of the rifle with minimal movement. So this light at the moment is not set up all that well for it because I actually have to roll over or come under the light, come under the rifle pretty significantly. So this is this is on my, my list of things that I wanna change about this particular rifle. Just something that I've been considering along the line. Uh, it's not, obviously it's not a big importance for me right now because, well, I got a lot of other projects right now. At the very least it has a light. That's kind of like a refinement for later on whenever I have some time. But that is why this enforce is mounted on the top rail and my flip up iron is moved behind it. It's not, not shooting with the iron behind the front, the, the light mounted on the front like that is not necessarily optimal because this does somewhat obscure the target. However, you can make it work. This doesn't have to be optimal in this case. I just need it present. That, that's kind of where I settled on that. Like I'll still be able to identify the target. I'll still be able to line up on it. Maybe I won't be able to make a 300 yard headshot with this type of setup, but at 100 yards, I'll still be able to effectively engage a man sized target. And this light being on top, I can reach it no matter what arm, what, what hand I'm using to fire. So that's how I prefer to have my rifle lights set up. All right, guys, those are the three things. Anything else, hand stops or vertical pistol grips, triggers, all that kind of stuff, all those types of things, those are pure preference, in my own opinion. Same with like equipment. Some people might say, well, a suppressor has got to be a mandatory thing. That way you can disguise the location of your shot and you can cut down your muzzle flash and all that kind of stuff. 
That is helpful. I would, I would implore you to make sure that you're adapting your rifle appropriately to the suppressor though. Have a shorter overall setup so that you don't turn a 16 inch gun into a near 24 inch gun because you're running a suppressor. This thing is already difficult to move around corners as it is depending on how tight the corners are. If I add another seven to eight inches to the end of it, it becomes nigh impossible. And there's, there's a dynamic that needs to be struck there. And that's the same for like IR or night vision in general. You kind of got to have a scenario that's going to drive you towards needing to use night vision to begin with and kind of whether or not night vision is truly fully applicable in different fighting type scenarios is kind of its own subject all by itself. If you have the opportunity and the situation that you need to run that type of equipment, absolutely go for it. I just would not necessarily put it on my short list that I tell everybody that they need to have. So that's kind of how I think about that overall and what you do need and what kind of becomes a purpose driven requirement to the individual. But I'm pretty confident that if you have these three things, you've got a really good start to a fighting rifle at that point. And you'll be able to effectively maneuver through most situations with this setup. All right, guys, I hope you found this helpful and it's pretty much what I got. So have a good day. Actually, before you guys go, I would like to hear about what your fighting rifle setup is. So go ahead and sound off in the comments section and let me know what it is that you're running and what drove you towards those different decisions and all that kind of stuff. I'd be, I'd be really, really interested to hear what you guys have set up. All right, now I'm done. Have a good day.